morning, fifth graders. Today we are going to work on unit one, lesson four. So yesterday you should have finished writing your summaries. You should have gotten some feedback from myself or another teacher. And hopefully um, you are definitely on the right page. And today we will work on practicing those skills again. So what are we learning and doing today? Well, we're practicing and determining main ideas and key details and writing a summary of signs of hope. So we're gonna repeat the same process that we did this week with a new section of the book. Learning targets for today. I can determine the main ideas of a text and explain how they are supported by key details. And I can summarize an informational text. So today think about what is one way you worked toward these targets in lesson two and three. So I want you to think about it in your head for 30 seconds or turn and talk to somebody at home. Go ahead. Okay, so we are moving on to the next section of the book, which is pages 10 through 17. And I want you to keep in mind, what is the text about as I read? Page 10, called Signs of Hope. In the post-Civil War segregated world, black people and white people went to separate schools, ate in separate restaurants, stayed in separate hotels and sat in different sections on trains and buses. In many places, they used different bathrooms, telephone booths, and water fountains. Blacks and whites went to separate pool halls, auditoriums, and circuses. Many blacks were restricted from using parks, libraries, and hospitals that served white people. Signs on public fa facilities often read colored and white in an effort to keep one rare race from coming in contact with the other. Segregation was part of everyday life almost everywhere, especially in the South. So over here, you can see the sign, waiting room for colored only. Many public places, especially in the South, were segregated. My father was six months old in the summer of 1919, the Red Summer. African-American blood flowed as pe Black people were assaulted and killed in race riots and lynchings. The racial tension escalated when Southern Blacks moved North to work in jobs created by World War I. So in this picture, you see signs of the times. People, people, people were even prohibited from drinking at the same fountain. From 1915 to 1930, nearly 1 1.5 million Black people migrated north at a rate of 100,000 per year. Many of them settled in New York, Chicago, St. Louis, and Detroit. The Black families who fled the South during this period hoped to find a better life and escaped Jim Crow life. However, they soon discovered that Jim Crow traveled too. The rapid shift in population caused overcrowding in many cities and increased resentment from many white workers who were now forced to work alongside blacks. When African-American families left the South, they took with them their hopes for freedom and opportunity. Mally Robinson, my grandmother, was one of the early pioneering migrants. She lived on a farm in Cairo, Georgia in 1919 with her husband, Jerry, and their five children. They were sharecroppers, which meant they farmed a section of land owned by whites for a share of the profit from the crops. This system kept black sharecroppers like my grandparents from getting ahead. Sharecroppers didn't own their farms. They had to buy all their seeds, food, and equipment on credit from the white landowners. At the end of the year, the black farmer had to give the white landowner up to one half of his crop and repay all the credit. The black farmers ended up with very little and often owed money to the white owner. After dealing with the frustrations of sharecropping, Jerry Robinson gave up and deserted the family. Mally couldn't maintain the farm on her own, but her, my grandmother was a determined woman with an unflappable faith in God. She packed up her children, Frank, Mac, Edgar, Will Willa, May, and Jackie, and took a huge risk. Mally and her family left the only life they'd ever known. They traveled by train to Pasadena, California. 
There they lived with her brother until Mally found work and a place for her family to live. Over here you see Mally Robinson and her five children from left to right. So Mac, my dad, Jackie, Edgar, Willa May, and Frank. They moved from Georgia to California in the early 1920s. My grandmother worked long hours cleaning and cooking in the homes of white families. Meanwhile, she insisted her children keep up their grades, work after school, and attend every or church every Sunday. The children learned early to protect each other. For a couple of years, my dad's sister, Willa May, took my father to school with her. Dad played alone in a sandbox outside her classroom until the kids came out for recess. As a boy, dad went to Cleveland and Washington Elementary Schools in Pasadena. The students were black. The teachers were white. My father only got an average grade, but he loved sports. Sorry guys, I had to pause for a second and talk to Dax. Okay, Pasadena was a pretty city with lots of parks and other public recreational facilities. My dad couldn't go in most of them. The local YMCA, Refused my father membership because he was black. The Pasadena movie houses he went to forced black people to sit in one section. The local soda fountain wouldn't serve black kids. Pasadena was divided into neighborhoods according to race. The boundaries were clearly drawn. Blacks lived in only certain parts of town. That didn't stop my grandmother. Mally and her sister and brother-in-law, Cora and Samuel Wade, raised enough money to buy a house. They ignored the racial boundaries and settled in, on a house at 121 Pepper Street. The house that they wanted happened to be in an all-white neighborhood. According to family stories, my grandmother knew that the owners wouldn't sell their home to a black family. Mally got a light-skinned niece who could pass for white to purchase the Pepper Street house for them. After the closing, the Robinson and Wade families moved in together. The neighbors weren't exactly well welcoming. Mommy. My father was three years old when he and his family moved to Pepper Street. When he was eight, dad got into a name calling fight with a little white girl who lived across the street. The children's verbal battle was interrupted when the girl's father came outside and started throwing rocks at my father. There were incidents like that meant to intimidate my grandmother into moving off Pepper Street. A cross was burned on their front lawn, but in spite of the pressure from neighbors, my grandmother refused to leave Pepper Street. Over time, the black became mixed with families from black, white, Asian, and Hispanic backgrounds. While my father fought relatively small battles against racism in Pasadena, African American leaders across the country took the struggle to a new level. They waged battles in courts, in newspapers, and at street demonstrations. They supported educational and economic equity. Black leaders and activists such as Ida B. Wells, Right here, Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois took different positions and offered different solutions to the problems of racial equality. So this is W.E.B. Du Bois. This is Booker T. Washington. Black owned and operated newspapers like the Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier, Boston's The Guardian, Ebony Magazine, formerly known as the Negro Digest the NAACP's monthly magazine, the Crisis, and the Associated Negro Press sprang up to tell a story of racial progress and encourage an anti-segregation resistance movement. There was also a small but growing professional class of African Americans who taught school, worked in hospitals as nurses and doctors, practiced law, and owned businesses. The Harlem Renaissance, named after New York City's vibrant Black neighborhood, Harlem, brought forth great African-American writers, artists, and musicians. Artists like Jacob Lawrence, writers like Langston Hughes, Claude McKay, County Cullen, and Zora Neale Hurston. Jazz musicians like Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, performers like singer, actor, activist, Paul Robeson, and dancer Bill Bojangles Robinson, all rose to new heights of fame and popularity through the Harlem Renaissance. So you can see all these people over here. The 
The glory of the Harlem Renaissance was short-lived. In 1929, it was replaced by a deep, deep economic depression. Dad was in junior high at the time. He helped his family out by taking on odd jobs like delivering newspapers, cutting the neighbor's grass, and selling hot dogs during football games at Pasadena's Rose Bowl. And he endured the problems associated with being poor and fatherless. When he was a teenager, Dad and his friends formed the Pepper Street Gang. They didn't use drugs, drink alcohol, or start fights, but they did throw clumps of dirt at passing cars, swipe golf balls, and sell them back to the golfers and steal fruit from the local grocers. Several key factors helped my dad avoid serious trouble. The first and most important was his devotion to his mother and the values she worked hard to instill in him. The second was his love of athletics. Most of dad's energy went into playing sports. In 1935, he was a star high school football quarterback at Moore Tech, where he also played baseball, basketball, tennis, and held records in track. Dad's older brothers were another big influence on him. He really looked up to Edgar Frank and, Mar and Max. Dad didn't always understand Edgar's out of behavior, but he admired his love of speed. Edgar's feet on roller skates and his bicycle were legendary. It was said Edgar could outrace the bus from Pasadena to Santa Monica, a 30 mile trip. Frank was my dad's favorite brother, but Mac became his idol. When dad was 13, he watched with pride as my, Mac won a place on the U.S. Olympic track and field team. Mac went to Berlin, Germany for the 1936 Olympic Games. Dad listened to all the track meets on the radio. The U.S. relay team made up of African-American athletes, Jesse Owens, Uncle Mac, Ralph Metcalf, Johnny Woodruff, and Cornelius Johnson won the gold medal. By the end of the Olympics, Owens had won four gold medals. Mac had won a silver in the 200-meter dash. The 1936 U.S. Olympic relay team's victory was more than a personal athletic triumph. The team won one for humanity. The performances of my uncle and other African-American athletes shattered Nazi leader Adolf Hitler's theory of racial superiority. The Nazis who rose to power in Germany in the 1930s believed that select white people known as Aryans were superior to all other races, including blacks and non-Aryan whites. German leader Hitler snubbed Jesse Owens by refusing to shake his hand at the Olympic medal awards ceremony. But Black America and freedom lovers everywhere celebrated this stunning victory over racism. The 1930s saw the rise of other African-American sports heroes. Joe Lewis, the Brown Bomber, was one of the most admired athletes of the time. On June 22, 1938, the heavyweight champion faced Germany's Max, Max Schmeling in the ring. Like the 1936 Olympics, more than sports re records were riding on the outcome. Europe was on the verge of a Second World War. Adolf Hitler was Schmeling, gave Schmeling his idea of the ideal racially pure man, a hero send-off. Americans counted on Joe Lewis to bring them victory. The fight of the century was on. It was as if the war had already been declared. Lewis knocked out Schmeling in two minutes, four seconds in round one. Joyous Americans all over the country, black and white, celebrated in the streets, but the victory part didn't last. The next morning, America woke up still separate and unequal. Okay, so that was a lot to digest and read. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. What you guys will work on today, because this is just going to be part one, is coming up with the gist. So it's actually going to be your job to go back and find the sections that it's talking about. So it's actually broken up again. Today we'll do pages 10 and 11 together, or the first two together, and then you guys will finish on the Google Doc. So take a second to reread pages 10 and 11. If you need to pause the PowerPoint so you can finish reading, you can do that. But for the sake of making this video not an hour long, I'm gonna jump to the next page. 
So don't go to the next page until you're ready. Okay, so what is this section mostly about? So after looking at those two pages, seeing the pictures, thinking about all the things that it's saying, a good gist for this section should be that the, after the Civil War, segregation was a part of everyday life almost everywhere. So even though slavery ended, it didn't mean that things were equal. Things were still segregated everywhere. Okay, then I'm going to have you reread page 12. So again, pause. Read it. And then what was this section mostly about? So if you remember, it's all about them. Mally Robinson and Jackie's mother worked hard to support her family. I'm sorry, Mally Robinson is Jackie's mother. So all the things that she did to support the family. So for your work time today, you're gonna finish the Google Doc um, by continuing to fill in the GIFs for each section. And then I want you to come back to thinking about identifying factors for success. So how have athletes broken barriers during his, the historical era in which they lived? And what factors can contribute to an individual success in a changing society? Okay. All right, guys, I will be available if you have any questions. Um, but you have done just a couple times now, so hopefully it'll go well. Have an awesome weekend.